good afternoon, DevOx. Great, great, you're all being here. I hope you grab some lunch. Uh, everybody has some lunch? Uh, I see they have plenty of lunch, so if you haven't grabbed lunch already, uh, they will have some leftover. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, we are a bit of in a hurry because we have only 45 minutes and I need you to grab your phone because we are going to do a little experiment. So please grab your phone if you have a hand free and um, you have to scan this code. And it will lead you to a survey and I need you to fill in it quickly. And if you're done, please raise your hands and keep them raised so I can see everybody have finish the survey. Cool. So everybody, <laughs> good. So Stefan already tested the, the Wi-Fi this morning, so everybody will manage to get to the survey. So it's done. Cool. Like 10%. Yeah. More people, more people. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. All right, cool. Um, so you were a part of an experiment, and what kind of an experiment? Well, what I did was an A-B experiment. So I divided you up into two groups, group A and group B, and you all had a different first question. Group A was asked, if was, is Mahatma Gandhi older or younger than nine years old when he died? And group A was asked, what ma was Mahatma Gandhi older or younger than 140 years old when he died? So who was in group A? Yes, and who was in group B? Uh, okay. Sometimes the PHP randomizer function doesn't work that properly, but now it did. Great. Um, and you all had to answer the same question. At what age did Mahatma Gandhi die? But before going to the uh, results, let, uh, let me look at what you thought it would be. Well, this is kind of a result. So we have group A was, was the, uh, the uh, question with nine years old and group B was the question with 140 years old. And you can see that there is actually is a difference because the median of group A was significantly, significantly lower than group B. Well, you all know he wasn't nine years old or 140 years old, right? That's implausible. So. What happened here? Cool. So, oh, that's a spoiler. Cool. So at what age did Mahatma Gandhi die? Well, you've already seen it. So 70 years old. So group B was actually quite close. Um, cool. Um, so what happened here? So what we have experienced can be explained by the anchoring effect. And the effect explains that when you're exposed to information, for example, that first question, that influence the way you think. Although it seems like not a valuable piece of information, it did, it did influence you. We've seen it in the slides, right? And how does that work? So when you thought about Mahatma Gandhi, then you thought, well, you may remember his face. Well, you, you may remember that he was from India. And you may remember that first question that I put into your head. And you use that piece of information and you think, well, nine years old, well, that's ridiculous. But let's increase it a bit. Let's increase it a bit until I feel comfortable with the answer. And the same goes for the 140 years old piece of information, you thought, well, let's decrease it a bit. And therefore, you may, the two groups may have answered the question differently. Although you knew, you knew it was a ridiculous uh, number. Cool. Um, you don't have to take my word for it or the amount of people in this experiment. This experiment was actually part of a large experiment which did research uh, about the anchoring effect, how people are actually biased. And they asked the groups quite a lot of questions. And this was actually part of it. And they have a group which had to answer um, 
questions with had implausible pieces of information like you did and a group, a control group, which actually contained some more information which was closely related to the uh, 78 years old. And they found that there was larger deviations from the real answer. So the implausible, the group which contained, uh, which had to answer the questions with the implausible anchors, deviated significantly more than the group who had some valuable pieces of information there. We can also experience this, this effect when we make software. For example, if I'm doing some planning poker um, and I have to estimate the complexity of a story, and somebody comes in and says, well, this story is, is really complex. It should be at least 20 points. Although I didn't thought of 20 and more like five, I'm influenced and I might not answer five, but answer eight, for example. So these kind of patterns which influence the way we think during, uh, during software creation are identified as cognitive biases. And when we make software, we are being influenced in numerous ways. There are plenty of occasions that your brain prevents you from basing your judgment purely on rational arguments. Luckily, there is some research into some common patterns and we're going to dive into some today. So, before heading into the, uh, the uh, cognitive biases, let me introduce myself. I'm Peter Wessels, I'm an IT consultant at InfoSport. I um, am a software engineer, I'm a teacher in domain-driven design. So if you're up for that, let's meet in the hallway. I'm leader of the Java community within InfoSport. And um, the claims I make are based on my own experience and the experience of my colleagues. And I have some research which um, I can show how things work. So the important thing here is that you may think differently. We all are different. And I'm only showing some patterns which might influence you, but it doesn't mean that you are always influenced in that way. Um, so we're going to dive into three common ways you can be influenced. How can we identify them? How do, we, who, how do they influence the way we make software? How to prevent them from doing any harm? And I want to avoid you making the mistakes that I make by explaining some um, cognitive biases. Cool. First up, when labor leads to love. Um, two years ago, I moved in with my girlfriend and we needed a new um, a place to store our clothes because my girlfriend actually has quite a lot of clothes and I didn't but we need a new uh, new closet anyway and like many people in the Netherlands uh, we go to Ikea and buy a piece of furniture and if you know Ikea then you know that you have to assemble them yourself and I often get this feeling like okay how I, am I going to do this um, and assembling such a piece of furniture can be tiresome. It can cost you blood, sweat, and tears. But in the end, I've managed. This is actually the piece of closet. <laughs> Somebody is applauding. <laughs> Didn't expect that. Um, but I spent two hours into assembling that piece of furniture. And now I'm really attached to that piece of furniture. I didn't know I can be attached to a closet, but now I am. And if you ask me what's the value of that piece of closet and you ask it to my girlfriend, which just got it, I built it for her and she said, good job, now I have a place to store my clothes. I, I consider this piece of furniture more of more value than my girlfriend. Nice. And although I know there are some screws missing over there, Actually, I assembled it twice because I put the, the wrong screw into that defect there, so I did it twice, so, I, so the two hours is two times assembling that piece of furniture. So I thought, okay, why is this? Why, why do I get overly attached to my closet? That's what you all think I, by now. 
Um, and this can be a, a, actually there is the IKEA effect, which explains that we get overly attached to the products we build ourselves. And it's not a term that I have thought of. There are actually some researchers, researchers that actually coined this term. And in a few experiments, they showed that when people build things themselves, they consider it to be more valuable to them. And the interesting thing is it doesn't need to be fun. You all agree, probably all agree that assembling furniture isn't fun. It doesn't need to add any value to the product. As I've shown you, there are actually some minor defects in the product. And I'm still overly attached to it. And they did an experiment actually with an IKEA product. And they uh, had two groups, a group of builders and a group of non-builders. And they were asked to either assemble the product, like the builders group, assemble the product. And the other group, like my girlfriend, actually got the box pre-assembled. And they asked two questions. The first question was, do you like the product? And they had a rating from 0 to 5. And it turned out that the builders actually liked the product 52% more than the non-builders. And the same goes for the value. They ask how much do you want to pay for this product? And it turned out that builders actually paid a premium, wanted to pay a premium for the box they assembled. And they want to pay 63% more, which is, which, is, which is significantly. As software creators, we also make stuff, right? We build products, we configure our platforms, we design, we implement new features. And all of these activities result in some kind of a product. Either it's a piece of code or it's like a, a CI CD pipeline. It's all, you can consider it as a product, right? So, are we also um, uh, subject to the IKEA effect? Well, I definitely am. Because I really like to make stuff. I like to implement new features. I like to build things from scratch. So early in my career, I did some. Um, I built um, um, a Spring framework from scratch, just knowing how to do dependency injection, for example. And every time I make such a thing, I consider it to be my baby, to be perfect in all its ways. However, it distracted me from criticizing my own work because it was my baby and I don't let anyone give some feedback on it and then learn from that feedback. And instead of learning from some valuable comments from my colleague and ultimately improving my skill set, I ignored it in the beginning of my career. And I want to prevent that effect. And if you want to prevent that effect, you can go both ways. You can either prevent it by the start, maybe not building it, building a, uh, a dependency injection framework yourself, or at the end. So what have you built and how to assess the quality of your product? So if you build stuff and you build, you, you open the pull request, are you really able to objectively value your work? Or does it, does it sometimes hurt when somebody makes some valuable comments? Well, it, it hurts for me sometimes. Um, and instead of learning from that feedback, if you ignore that feedback, it might result into a messy foundation, for example. You have some red flags along the way and you ignore them and it will turn out to be messy. And a few years ago, I was part of a large, uh, a highly enthusiastic group of software engineers, and we experienced something similar. And we were using a brand new framework, and instead of learning about the fundamentals, about event sourcing, we just went with it. We didn't care about all the problems we thought we had to fix, we just went with it. We thought we were making value for our customers, which we did in the end, but because we ignored some red flags, we didn't learn from our, uh, from our, um, uh, our process. 
And what we should have been doing was con uh, tapping into some um, um, external solutions and knowledge. Because there are a lot of people who knew how to do event sourcing properly. In this conference, there are, I think, I've seen three uh, talks already about event sourcing. So there is a lot of information about event sourcing, but we didn't use it because we thought we were doing a great job. And when you build things from scratch or when you in invent something from scratch, you have to take into account that you have some kind of investment in time and money. Uh, it also, um, if you build a dependency injection framework or event sourcing framework from scratch, it also um, requires you some time to market. So you have to build things and it costs time instead of using some um, existing framework, for example. And if you build things from scratch, other problems may arise because the, the products that are already there have many R&D in it. And there are some really brilliant engineers who make that product. And I have a question for you. Does this sound familiar? So let's keep uh, raise some hands who think we experience the IKEA effect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think 90%. I was a little bit afraid that I was talking to you and nobody raised their hand, but okay. Um, so that raised the question, why do we do, do the things that we do? Why are we subjected to this bias? So luckily there is some research about this bias and there are a few reasons why you might get overly attached to your baby. Um, one is that we might feel the need to be competent. Um, we have the need for believing in ourselves and thinking that we can do things well. And research shows actually that if you're highly confident, that it lowers your chances for stress and depression. So it's not strange that we feel the need for, um, uh, we need to feel the need for the, uh, competent. And because every time we carry out this task successfully, like assembling uh, an IKEA closet, it boosts our confidence. That's great, right? Um, there's also another reason, if you spend like two hours into building something, uh, you, want to be, um, you want to feel that it was, um, um, that you, you want to justify your effort. You don't want to feel that the two hours are wasted. You want to feel like this is I th this two hours is actually worth my time. So then you can tell yourself, okay, it is worth my time, and then you get overly attached to your product. So that leaves the question: how can we prevent the IKEA effect? So I already mentioned before the work, consider third-party products. There are a uh, lot of great open source products are uh, companies that build products which you can benefit from. You underestimate how much of R&D are actually in those um, products. And what I don't mean is to use this, uh, this package, this note package. It's a uh, package is, is odd. It's just a single line. It tells you if it's odd or not, a uh, number. But the strange thing is that it's downloaded 1.9 million a month, 33 million in total. So a lot of people are using this package. And like I mentioned, you are not the first to a problem, even in new technologies. Because event sourcing already um, um, lived, uh, already existed before the frameworks came out. And you have a great opportunity in these conferences to learn how to do things properly, how to discuss how, uh, how to solve certain problems. There are a lot of great people which have experience in the problems you are facing today. Another great tool is to uh, use architectural decision records. Um, in such a record, it's just a, p uh, just a document, and you uh, describe, okay, what is my problem, what I want to solve, what are the, po uh, the possible solutions which you considered, and why did you actually choose for a certain solution. So that allows you to evaluate your decision yourself, 
but also in addition, your colleagues or your team members can also review your decision and avoid you to being biased. And it's actually a great piece of document and documentation you have. And the, the last one is to be aware of your bias. So now you all know that if, you, if it hurts when you have a uh, comment on your code, then you might think again, okay, do I get overly attached to this product and let's discuss it and let's learn from it. And I think we can be more productive if we prevent the Aki effect. Cool. Next one, uh, joining the majority. So um, if you look at conferences now, and uh, if you look at conferences and the great talks, you see some more these hype lingo it's like cloud, native images. I left out AI because it was too obvious. Um, event sourcing, domain driven design. And I had the chance to do a greenfield project a few years ago. And I thought, oh, I go to conferences a lot and now I can use all those technologies in this single product, uh, project. And we felt like kids in the candy store. Let's pick some, let's do some um, domain driven design, let's do some um, event driven architecture, let's do some cloud native spe specification by example, of course. Event sourcing, um, CQRS, um, all these technologies, and of course, DevOps. However, the struggle was real because all those technologies were new and we had to learn it and we had to be productive at the same time because the client actually. Um, Believes or expects us to uh, to um, bring value to the table every sprint, right? So we had to be productive and learning on the same time. And rework was inevitable because we learned from uh, we learned that we did the things the wrong way because we actually didn't knew what we were doing. And what we might have experienced is called the bandwagon effect. And uh, the term bandwagon ori originates from the idea that people are like jumping on a, onto a wagon that's in motion or gaining momentum. And simply symbolizing the desire to be part of something that's gaining momentum or widespread accept acceptance. And you can see it everywhere in stocks, social media and politics. And there was actually a famous um, research about this phenomenon. It's about uh, Hung Hung it's carried out by Hungarian researchers, and they have shown that political polls not only captures voting behavior but also influence the way people vote. And how they have how they have shown that is that in Hungary they have like a two round voting, uh, two rounds two rounds of voting. And they have seen that in between those voting rounds, the parties that were gaining momentum actually gained more momentum in the second round. But that's on a large scale. So if you're making software, you can be in a meeting which, for, for example, discusses GraphQL. If you, are just, uh, if you uh, have an API, just a normal REST API, and somebody thinks, okay, let's switch to GraphQL because it heard it on a conference, for example. And people might join him and think, okay, this is a great idea. And more people might join him and think it's a great idea. And if you are at the end and you have to agree or disagree with it, I think you are being influenced by because other people said uh, that they're agreeing with that idea. Because stopping a moving train is very hard. However, if you switch from REST to GraphQL, and there is no really a good argument to do that, then it is not, fi it's not the best idea to do it. And you waste research resources, which you can use for actually making an impact for your customer, for example, or your product. But then you get these kind of questions. Are you still working on a monolith? Everybody moved on, moved on the, the bandwagon, which called microservices, right? So going against the bandwagons requires some bravery because sometimes it is 
a good idea to just leave it at an, as a monolith and split up it later on if you need to. You also might be affected by the bandwagon because I looked up my talk and there were quite a quite significant uh, amount of people which were joining my talk. Could it be that you might be influenced because many people were joining? And I also voted myself for it, so I helped gaining momentum, of course. And I'm not blaming you for doing it, but you might be affected to this bias yourself just before this talk. So why are we subjected to this bias? So the things that um, get into play is the availability heuristic. So heuristics are simple strategies that humans can use to solve complex, um, complex problems. They form some sort of uh, a shortcut. Because every time you make a decision, it costs you mental energy. And sometimes it is just easier for you to, to think, okay, there are a lot of people going to this session, let's just go with it, instead of reading the whole summary. Who of you read the summary of my talk? Ah, great, then I know that you're not that affected at all. <laughs> cool. Um, and if you look at technologies at conferences, you might, might know this hype cycle. So there are a lot of technologies, new technologies, which gain visibility and are at these conferences. But you can easily exchange visibility by availability. So the more it's visible, the more it's available for you to choose. So the old technologies aren't on these uh, conferences, but it may be the best fit for your product. There are also some other causes which have influenced you. Um, some people are looking for other people what to do. So you might be influenced by other people. Okay, if other people are doing it, I'm doing it as well. Um, some people have the desire to be liked or to be accepted and, um, uh, and base their judgment on other people. Um, and some people think, okay, the majority is right. So if the majority goes for a certain technology, I must do the same. So how can we prevent the bandwagon effect? So with all the biases, it's pretty much awareness is the first step. If you're aware of the bandwagon, you can uh, think, okay, why am I choosing for this technology? Um, should I do more research or is it because I'm, um, I have seen it at the conferences? Have I considered uh, a lot of solutions for my problem? Another is, uh, educate yourself with the hype cycle. So there are some companies which actually develop these hype cycles. Uh, it's a, a valuable piece of information. And you can check for yourself, is this a technology which is visible a lot? And then you might uh, check for yourself if you're being influenced by the, the fact that it's available to you. And you have some questions you ask yourself. So what problem does it solve better than before? Do I actually have that problem? Uh, what's the trade-off? Because there is always a trade-off. Some things are going to be uh, easier, some things are going to be hard. And do I understand that? And what complexity does it add? There's actually a great talk about the survivorship bias, which is closely related to this bias by my colleague. And you can find the link in the slides afterwards. Cool. That leads me to the last bias. Love the ceremony. Um, during the time I was preparing my presentation, I visited my grandma, which was in the hospital, and she was watching the coronation of King Charles in the UK. And she loved the coronation. She loved the splendor. She loved every second of it. And I was a little bit confused because I thought he was already king. Um, so I didn't know why this coronation had to take place. Um, and I didn't know uh, what kind of symbolism, symbolism was behind it. But people tend to li uh, like it, and my grandma, grandma liked it, so I went for, uh, for it. Um, but it turns out that people actually tend to love ceremony. And we do in our jobs. Because all these kind of meetings are in my agenda. 
We do nowadays stand-ups, refinements, retrospective, all these meetings. And are all these meetings any always valuable to you? Or do they lead to waste? And I came across this meme, accepted the job as a software engineer, eight hours of meetings a day. That could, can't be true, right? But why are we doing this? Why are we going to meet and why are meetings sometimes a waste of our time? So what can come into play is Parkinson's, Parkinson's law of triviality and that people tend to focus on the trivial tasks like discussing the weekend or just uh, going through your uh, sprint board and uh, get some status updates. But sometimes we don't ask the difficult questions because the difficult questions are, are we going to finish this sprint? How are we going to finish this sprint? If you just go this, uh, by the sprint board and just ask everybody, okay, what did you do? Then your stand-up might lead to waste. But it's comfortable, right? Just ask everybody what your status update. Oh, it's fine. It's the easy start of your day. And this law is also known as the bike shed effect. So people tend to discuss more about how to build a bike shed than how to build a nuclear power plant. And if you're in a meeting like 60, 60 uh, minutes, then the like 55 minutes goes to discussing some of the trivial matters. But the actually hard part is how to build this nuclear power plant. And we tend to only discuss it for two and a half minutes. And we do this quite a lot, not with nuclear power plants, I think, but with other activities. So who of you are categorizing your email by hand? Oh, oh okay, only 5%. Okay, then I have bad, uh, good, bad news for the 5%, good news for the 95%, because there is actually research which shows that just categorizing your emails is a waste of time. You spend like 68 hours on average on it, and it actually makes it harder for you to find your emails afterwards. But it feels comfortable, right? Just easy, just dragging your email to the right folder and thinking, okay, I'm going to use it later. And if you want, want to define this easier task, you can use this, this uh, graph. So you have like the trivial versus the consequential uh, um, axis. So the consequential means that it's actually going to mean something. Uh, uh, so how go are we going to build this nuclear power plant, for example? And the trivial is, uh, are what kind of color do we need to uh, paint our bike shed? And the bike shedding happens in the easy and trivial tasks. And I came across this email from a maintainer from B FreeBSD, which actually coined the term, and he said, okay, just because you're capable of building a bike shed, you need, you need not need to argue about every little feature just because you know enough to doing so. So why are we subjected to this bias? So I ask everybody, why, why do we do these things? And I get some quotes like, it's fun. Or it's important. The devil is in the details, for example. I don't know if that, if that goes for everyone. But it turns out that we might feel more comfortable asking for the status updates than asking, how are we going to fix this sprint? How are we going to manage this? And there are some discussions like tabs and spaces, like single quotes versus double quotes, like flame wars about our tools. What is the, great, the best tool for the job? Does it actually matter if you use tabs versus spaces? Yeah, and I see a lot of people nodding. <laughs> of course, of course. And if you are reviewing a pull request, for example, is this actually a valuable piece of, uh, of, of comment? Please use empty list instead of list off. Well, they both work, right? So why are we going to spend 10 minutes about it? And if we do 10 minutes every pull request, or every uh, time this 
this uh, problem arise, then it leads to waste. And make sure you use the final keyword, okay? And please use the stream, API, stream APIs, it will be faster. This is actually my favorite one, because then you're going to the rabbit hole of uh, checking if it's any faster or not, and then discuss, okay, it's not any faster, and then you waste it like a half a day. So how can we prevent the IKEA effect, uh, the bike shedding effect? Um, automate your trivial matters. So we are in the business of automation. So these kind of things, we can automate them. We can have to discuss them at first, and then we can automate them. So there are actually some great tools which help you with it. Arrow prone by Google, for example, or check style, sonar, spotless, or open rewrite. All, they, all those tools help you to set in stone, okay, these this are my coding guidelines, and if somebody doesn't comply with these coding gui uh, guidelines, we have to make a comment about it. And then you don't, uh, don't have the discussions about uh, every single time. And when somebody has a valuable comment and a, and a good idea why you need to, uh, to um, edit your coding guidelines, well, then you can uh, uh, edit your check style or edit your adding prone configuration and went, uh, go with that. And then you got 99 problems, but your max, max width line ain't one of them. Um, another one is make meetings worth your time. So you can um, add structure to this meeting. So set a goal for each meeting. Um, keep on topic, just focus on the outcomes of the meeting. So if you set a goal for each meeting, then you can easily tell your colleagues when they are off track. Use feedback loops. So a few years back, I asked after every meeting, was this worth our time? And if somebody uh, answered with no, we have something to discuss. How can we improve this meeting? Or should we skip this meeting at all? And what you can do is dedicate uh, time for um, complex matters. So if you are in the business of building a nuclear power plant, just uh, reserve some time for deciding how to build that piece of software. And what I don't mean is uh, using shock colors for every team member. So when they are like talking too much, then, you, then they give a shock. That's not what I mean. So forget that. Uh, cool. So to sum up, what we've seen is the IKEA effect, when labor leads to love. We have seen the bandwagon effect, when we jump on hype trains, and we have seen the bike setting effect, wasting your time on trivial matters. And if you're aware of your bias, you're able to battle them. And you think, if you think by now, oh, I made all these mistakes, and in hindsight, we should have done things differently, then you might be subjected to another bias, which is called the hindsight bias. People convince themselves that, that something which happened could be um, predictable or, um, and was not inevitable. And then you can think, thank uh, Captain Hindsight. So, that leaves me to the last quote of Mahatma Gandhi, which is, the future depends on what you do today. And I want to thank you for all being here with this talk. Um, there, there is actually a great uh, book, Thinking Fast and Slow. If you want to have the, the slides, uh, you can scan the QR code. You can follow me on, on Twitter uh, or X, what you want. And please rate this app, uh, talk in the app. I'm looking forward to all your feedback, how to improve this, or just leave a five-star review. It's also fine. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for all being here, and it was the show. And I'm going to make one picture. Thanks. <laughs>